What's going on, guys? Waco here, your humble host for symposium number four, Next Generation Watch Leadership. Thank you so much for joining us. So guys, arrayed on this stage to me is really some of the most interesting, unique, respectful, and humble guys that I know that have all entered the watch industry. But let's introduce them in first a slightly unconventional way by their parents. So the architect of the greatest luxury empire in the world, Bernard Arnault, Jacob Arabov, a uniquely American success story with serious watchmaking clout now. Vianne Holter, one of my favorite independent watchmakers and a true poet, and also the stepdaughter of Denis Flageolet over there, co-founder of Debethune. Benjamin Kufer's uh, father, Mark, was the owner of Roventa Henix, which was Switzerland's biggest white label uh, producer of watches. Brian Goldberg's father is in the audience, Danny Goldberg, who is a legend in the watch industry, kind of a sex symbol, and also <laughs> a, a true innovator in secondary with Watchbox. Uh, Pierre Beaver's dad basically needs no introduction. He's one of the greatest legends in the watch industry. Jean-Claude Beaver, uh, the greatest marketeer in watches of all time. And Richard Mill, who is seriously one of the nicest, coolest, most humble people in the watch industry, is also the watch industry's, to me, greatest success story. So I give you now, from this side to this side, Brian Goldberg, co-sales director of Watchbox, Pierre Beaver, co-founder of J.C. Beaver, Alexander Mill, commercial director of Richard Mill, Jean Arnaud, Marketing and Development Director of uh, Vuitton Watches, Benjamin Arabov, CEO of Jacob, Victoire Halter, High Decoration Specialist and Atelier Manager for Vianney Halter, and Benjamin Kufer, Founder of Norkin. Welcome, guys. So my first question is, of course, and, and what I'm so impressed with with the people on this panel is the way you have entered this industry with so much humility, so much respect, so much grace, but at what point did you feel a calling to join the watch industry? Pierre Beaver, take it away. So for my part, it was very uh, natural growing up in a household where watchmaking was the center of attention all the time. Um, my father was always involving the family in everything he did. So bringing over clients, retailers, suppliers. Um, I, I, was just, I based in this industry. And during my when I was a teenager, I actually was always like, People were like telling me, oh, so you're going to do like your father? Are you going to work in the watch industry? Um, and I kind of had this re rebellious attitude where I was like, no, I'm, I'm never going to do that. Too much pressure, too much responsibility. And I have huge respect for my father's career, so I really didn't want to have an impact on that. Um, but growing up and being around watches, I just felt it was supernatural. And that's how I got in the watch industry. Amazing. Thank you so much, Pierre. Alex, same question to you, sir. Um, for me, it was never, never really a, a, a question. My path was definitely not leading toward uh, uh, that industry. And uh, it's just slowly, very slowly but surely, uh, getting more involved uh, first via the video for the brand, working, working first as an intern, then doing the video for the brand, that I start meeting the people. Uh, uh, that make this brand. So there's my dad, but there's a lot of other people uh, uh, behind it at the factory, on the market, and starting to meet these people and see how passionate they get. And the journalists and like people like you, eh? uh, uh, that's exactly what gives you, oh, there's something there. There's really something with this brand. And then slowly but surely uh, 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 getting more, more, more and more interest and ultimately uh, going to America and uh, uh, learn a little bit more about what is the business side of the brand, and then I got hooked completely. So first it was the people, then the product, then the business, and uh, from that I just follow, uh, follow my way, and leading me here. Phenomenal. Jean, what was your moment, the calling? Um, one key moment is a bit, a bit like Alex said, I got hooked at some point. Um, Again, the group does a lot, a lot of things amongst, uh, amongst one of them is watches. Uh, obviously, the interest was there, a bit of the same as it was for you know, leather goods and, and, and other parts of the industry. But um, you know, I've always had that specific interest for mechanical things, cars, planes, whatever. Uh, that came about uh, when, whenever I got interested in watches, when my brother started working there, uh, working in the industry, starting asking questions and things. And I mean, a lot of people will relate when I say that as soon as you start getting interested in the industry, more often than not, you get hooked, uh, and then you get really in, thrown into it, and you start looking into the details of watches, you start getting details of the history of them, everything under the sun, and uh, that, that really came about. I had a lot of time to kill at university, so that was, uh, that was my, main, my main occupation, really. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. Benjamin, same question to you, sir. So um, I got a phone call one day from my father, Jacob, and uh, he called me to the office. He goes, Ben, can you please come? Um, can you please come to the office? I need to talk to you. I said, okay. So Wednesday afternoon. So I came, and he had this um, very kind of overwhelmed, stressed uh, facial expression. Um, he sat down. I sat down. And he grabbed my hand and he said, Ben, um, I need you to join the company. Um, I want you to become CEO. And for me, family is everything, and especially um, my father, who, if you've spent time with us, he's also my best friend. So I dropped everything. I called, uh, I called the managing director of the company that, that I was running. And I said, congratulations, you're the new CEO. <laughs> and um, the next week, I joined the company. Thank you very much. Victoire, same question. In real, the watch industry never really called me. Uh, the, but the craftsmanship really called me from the beginning of my life. Um, and one day, I spoke with Denis and Vianney, and they offered me to do internship in their uh, respective company. And I said, why not? It's, it's a way to discover new stuff and new way to work. And I started um, the, the precision of uh, the work of both really impressed me, and it catched me forever, I think. Fantastic. Thank you. Ben, come on, give it to us. For me, it's, uh, you know, there was two moments, like uh, two emotional moments. The first one was, you know, growing up, just watching my dad, you know, he was passionate about two things that I really remember. Three, if you count the family, was football, that's when he would shout, or when he was talking about watches with Rolf Schneider. That was the two moments you would hear him scream at home. And um, so for me, it was, you know, that passion growing up. The second moment uh, was when, you know, in 2017, um, working at Breitling, the company was sold was kind of that turnaround moment where you would decide, am I staying in this industry? You know, for me, after my father uh, selling his company, I went to Breitling, I thought that would be the next big mission. So um, after Breitling being sold, it was like, okay, you know, is this the moment? And I decided it would be my life moment to change that and, you know, stay in the industry, follow my passion. So I think that was really the true moment where I realized this is my industry was in 2017. Amazing, thank you so much. Brian, my first question for you, sir, is that you work side by side by, with your father and he has a truly larger-than-life personality. He's also a brilliant man. What is it like to work with him on a daily basis? And how is that an asset to you? The first question was an easy one. Um, I don't want to say exhausting, um, but uh, no, I mean, it's, honestly, it's fantastic. I mean, he's a great coach. Um, he never stops. So, I mean, the ideas just keep coming and keep coming, and I would say, like, one of the things that I've learned from him is just knows are free, and it just takes one yes to change everything. And I feel like that's really how we operate. Amazing. Pierre, one of the most interesting things your father ever told me is that he wanted to go travel the world. And I think it was Tokyo that you guys were going to with you when you were a teenager because you gave him a fresh perspective on things. And since you guys have launched JC Beaver together, what I really like is it really feels like a dialogue, right? Rather than, you know, uh, like father and son, it also feels like two best friends creating a brand together. Tell me about this experience. What's it like to work side by side with the legendary Jean-Claude Biver? And uh, what asset is that to you? So, so it's not always easy. Uh, our teams can uh, testify of that. We, we, the dialogue is not always very civilized between my father and myself. Uh, he, he can get very emotional at times, but um, no, it's really interesting. I have a huge respect and uh, I'm really here to learn about his experiences, 50 years in the watch industry, the do's and don'ts, his doubts, uh, his strengths, his weaknesses, uh, but also to really bring something new to the table, some fresh perspectives, as you said, um, also try and challenge him sometimes, although I, I think he's, he's right, just to see where, how we can push the limits together and find something really innovative and um, that really represents both of us. Alex, same question, sir. Richard Mill is a larger than life character. He's also one of the coolest guys I know. What's it like to work side by side with him? It's it's very inspiring. My the the the, the same the relationship I had with my dad is uh, is uh, is very strange. You know, like a divorced uh, divorced family. 
So uh, I really met my dad later on on uh, in my life and uh, uh, had many different relationships throughout the year with my dad. It was very uh, a different type of relationship and uh, uh, always good. And I don't know, and right now the, the, the relationship we have is, is just the, the one I always uh, opt for, which is his became my mentor very like recently three years ago he really became that that uh, that personality for me my mentor and uh, he's, he's just the best because he is the coolest he's really the most the coolest and the the, the most humble person I met in my life and uh, he, he, he tend to when he talk to you and when he when he, he, he when we go through uh, uh, stuff together he is really like that he's really taking time to to explain to you everything and uh, 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 giving you always the best advice uh, and he always come down to the human side of everything. Always forget that, uh, uh, never forget, sorry, that uh, uh, deep inside we're just human and uh, 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 we need to work with that and uh, yeah. That's amazing. So Jean, what I like about Al what Alex said, he, he talked about humility and I, I feel that you know, you are actually an amazingly humble person. And I know, I liked you even before I met you because, so the way I met Jean was uh, I launched a limited edition watch with Tag Heuer. It was called the Blue Dreamer. And then I was searching through my email and there was this really polite message that said, oh, hi, how are you? I really like your watch. Would it be possible for me to purchase two of these, one for myself and one for my brother? And in the bottom it said, Jean Arnaud, right? <laughs> so I immediately assumed this was some friend of mine playing a practical joke. I thought it like Hodonkee or someone like that had decided, had, 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 you know, got my email. Um, and then I asked Catherine from Tag Heuer, and she said, no, actually, no, that's true. Um, so for you, I think everyone who knows you also really admires the humility with which you conduct yourself. Why is that important to you? I almost forgot about that story. You know, so <laughs> um, I mean, humility, I don't know, it would, would describe me as a whole. Uh, certainly not. Uh, but it's just, uh, you know, we are fortunate enough to be in, all of us here, to be in a, a position where... Uh, we have access to things that, uh, from, a, from a very early age that other people don't necessarily have. And we need to take that opportunity as much as we can and, and make something good out of it, you know. Uh, obviously, we're not making nuclear weapons here, so we're all talking about something that is very, you know, passion, passion forward. And everybody here is very passionate about what they're doing. And the goal at the end of the day is really to make some amazing product, amazing, uh, uh, amazing stuff, uh, really focus on the craftsmanship side of things and, and, and try to value everybody in that works uh, with, for, whatever it is in, in the process uh, to, um, to make that product uh, happen in the end, you know? Whether it be distribution, whether it be even just uh, finishing the movement or, or just all, all the different steps that end up making a watch, you need to value all these steps differently and, uh, and, and really put them forward as much as possible. Thank you very much, sir. Benjamin, having gotten to know you also, I, I th yeah, there's a great humility and respect from you guys as well. Looking at the outside from Jacob, everyone looks at it as this incredibly glamorous brand, let's put it that way, right? But when I got to know you and your dad, I realized, first of all, I love the fact that you guys are best friends. You like spend most of your time high-fiving each other, which I find amazing. And then uh, the other thing is that you guys are just very down-to-earth, like nice people. Why is that important to you and how, you know, uh, uh, tell me about that. Well, I mean, my, my father has come from very humble beginnings. Uh, he migrated from, uh, from Uzbekistan at the age of 17 to the United States with absolutely nothing. And uh, has worked his whole career to be where he's at with, with a lot of ups and downs. Um, and he really instilled that in myself and my brothers. Um, he, it was a constant reminder of uh, t to know where we came from and, and, and to be humble because um, that's, that's kind of the mindset that he instilled in us. Thank you, sir. Victoire, what is it like to work with the great Vianney Halter? He is like such a poetic character as well. From what I can see, you're super organized uh, and you bring a lot of structure. What is the balance between the two of you? In working with Vianney is really natural and, and we have a lot of fun. Um, he's a, a really funny guy. Um, our temper are, are quite similar, but uh, the, the difference between us is that Vienna is an artist deep, deep in his heart. And I really like the organization side. So on, <laughs> on my side, I, I try to do a bridge between this idea, uh, his ideas, uh, the, um, the office and the workshop. So I try to put some structure in the, in the company to help him and to support him so he can focus on his creativity and, 
and making watches. Amazing. Thank you so much. Man, I'm going to ask you a different question. You have Pierre's father, Jean-Claude Beaver, on your board of directors. Why, how did this happen, and what does he bring to your board of directors? You know, uh, I was just speaking with Pierre before. Um, we're uh, a very young team. So when we launched Norcane back in 2018, we were three guys at the time, um, average age 30 uh, years old then. Um, today, five years later, we say we're 35. Makes us sound older, but we're still the same same guys. We grew the team. And um, Jean-Claude, um, he's a, you know, he really has a passion for this industry. He actually contacted us just when the COVID crisis started. Um, a guy, Mike Bauer, who we both know, uh, spoke to him about Norca and said, hey, these guys are being, you know, doing really well, but now COVID crisis will be tough for them. He called us and he said, hey, I want to come and see what you're doing. And he came to Nidau and, we, you know, we all got prepared and he came in and he, he looked at everything and said, it's amazing, everything you've built in, in one and a half years. Where's the innovation part? When is that coming into the brand? And I said, well, you know, now COVID and then probably 224, 25, we have something with new materials. He said, forget that. It's now or never. COVID will change everything. So the next morning I called him and said, where would you start? He said, I'll come with you to see the suppliers. And that's really how it started. It was all natural. Like he was helping us. And then we continued. We visited the next supplier. And eventually I said to him, Jean-Claude, um, you know, we're really even designing now. Do you want to, you know, look at the watch and he said of course I'm coming to the design meeting I, I won't give you the material we don't do the design together I was like okay so it was all natural and we're super excited I mean now three today in three weeks we're launching the watch the collection and uh, we're very proud because I think you know with COVID a young company now to bring out new materials and something innovative is, is a great sign for the Swiss watch industry amazing thank you so much Brian Goldberg Watchbox is a powerhouse, right? Uh, you guys were the, the kings of secondary. Then you start to fuel uh, independent brands by the you know purchase of a Devithune. Now you've also become an editorial powerhouse by acquiring Jack Forster as well. I mean, uh, talk to us about your role and what you see is the future of Watchbox. Um, I think that the future of Watchbox is what it's always been, is just educating the market at large on our industry. Um, we've always taken a, an education approach first, right? Like if we teach collectors and clients about these different brands that perhaps don't get as much attention as they should, um, that collectors will find them. And that these watches themselves are inherently scarce and rare. Um, many of the brands have production in the only few hundred pieces per year. And that uh, and they create some of the most emotion of any of the watches that are made on the planet. And I just think that um, we've always taken that approach first. And that through scarcity and rarity, it just creates value in the secondary market and, and collectors have agreed, right? So it's, uh, and that was the same feeling that we had with uh, Debethune. We were honestly, we were a retailer first, collectors first, and we felt that they were some of the finest watches that have ever been made. Um, and when we were given the opportunity to invest, we just couldn't turn it down. Amazing, thank you so much, Pierre. You are the co-founder of one of the most hotly anticipated brands in the world. Please tell us a little bit about what to expect from the future. Uh, and from what we understand, the price for the initial watches will, will not be insignificant. Tell us a little bit about the values related to this. So it's actually a great question, the, the question of price. And it's actually a question that we uh, ask ourselves and my father mo on most days. We expect our teams to ask themselves this question. We expect our suppliers as well because the, what we're aiming for is something very high in, in quality. Um, so for us, it's very important that everybody working on this project has this in mind that it's going to be expensive. It's going to be very expensive, but we have to put the quality, the soul, the love and passion into the watches we're going to be making. Um, now it's a question that I'd love to debate with you because it's a really rewarding question, like what we can expect. Um, but at the moment, as we and it's a working process. I think it's better we answer that question with a watch on the table and it will be the, big, the biggest test for us. Uh, we'll, we'll either learn from it or be very happy with what we've done. But you can expect some interesting, modern yet traditional high-end watchmaking uh, with lots of focus and detail on finishing, uh, complications, and materials. Thank you very much, sir. Alex? Richard Mille today is not a watch, it's a cultural phenomenon. It is a symbol for success in the world. Uh, you now have watches uh, that are, the premium on the watch itself is the equivalent of a house in, in a lot of countries, right? How do you deal with trying to figure out who to allocate watches to 
And also, do you sometimes feel it's important to re-stress the innovation and technical roots of the brand while everything is going so crazy? First, I really don't think we left uh, our roots uh, uh, out. Uh, uh, for us, it's still the base of any watch we are, we are releasing is uh, the technical. That's at least that's where we get excited when uh, um, either my dad or we come with a crazy idea and uh, uh, we say, okay, now the job is to, uh, is to do actually, actually do that watch. So we never, we never forget about the technical aspect. Now about the, 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 the hype, the trend uh, uh, around, the, around the brand, it's, I, I mean, it's very easy. I, I was looking at, your, at the same panel uh, on, uh, I think, Monday, uh, Tuesday, uh, and the, the answer will be the same for the allocation is about passion. It's, it's not the same thing, obviously, when you have 5,000 pieces to allocate than 300, that's a given, but uh, we always look toward that. We look for the people who, who will give us the hint of uh, actual passion toward the brand. And uh, uh, the watches are made with passion, I think. You know that, but I, I think you can see it on the watches. That's why they are so out there and so different than, than anything you can see. And uh, uh, because they come really from the bottom of our heart, and uh, we want the watch, the maximum of our watches, to end up on a wrist of people that feel that same vibe and that want the exact same vibe when they look at the, at the watches. So that will be, uh, that's the, the first thing we're looking, the, the, the passion in the eyes of the, of the client. Thank you, sir. Jean, you know, we, we talked about watches that we love in common, and we brought up uh, Kari, we brought up uh, a bunch of different brands, but I think what, the, what I took away was that you are in love with quality, in, in, in love with true uh, beauty in watchmaking, in which way... Craftsmanship as a whole. And craftsmanship. In which way will you integrate this more and more into Vuitton for the future? Yeah, I mean, we have a, what I like to call a hidden gem. Uh, in, in, in watchmaking, which is La Fabrique du Temps. Not a lot of people know uh, about it or, or anything like that. You know, it's, uh, certain people visit it uh, uh, here and there and get to see a little bit what we do there. Um, obviously, we have a lot of savoir-faire. We got a lot of people working there with a, a very high level of craftsmanship. Um, but the goal for us in, in the next few years is just to keep building on that and try to really become uh, as closely as, as close as possible to uh, uh, really the reference for uh, high quality craftsmanship uh, and, and high quality as a whole, both in terms of obviously movement finishing, movement construction, but also in terms of dial making, case making, hand making, and things like that. You know, well, we really want to bring all of these uh, métiers together uh, to 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 bring something forward and really put a value add to our to our pieces by saying not only do we make everything in house, but we make everything with. Uh, the highest level of, of quality and highest level of finishing, all in-house, uh, all made by, by, by people that we've uh, trained and we've put through our processes uh, in, in, in a different way. And that's really where I want to put the emphasis on in the next few years. Is uh, it's, a, it's a long process. It, it doesn't happen uh, uh, one day to the next, you know, but at least it's, it, it will get there one day and, uh, and hopefully we'll manage to put, uh, uh, you know, a, a, lot, a little more savoir-faire in the general place of watchmaking over time, you know. Thank you, sir. Uh, Benjamin, uh, Jean mentioned savoir-faire, and I think what's really interesting about the watches you create, the, if we look at the Astronomia, if we look at the Twin Turbo Furious, if we look at the Godfather, there's so much horological ambition in what you're trying to do. You guys are very open about the fact that you work with partners, Cirque de Ologea, Concepto. How do you work with them in such a way that you're really pushing each other to the next level? I think one of our greatest assets is our partnerships because they have the open mindset to take innovation to the next level. Um, it's one of my favorite parts of the job to sit in the meetings between myself, Jacob, and the partners because there's so much healthy back and forth that goes into um, what could be done, what risks could we take, how far could we reach, and a lot of the times uh, our partners themselves don't know what's gonna be successful or not, so they go through many testing, many testing to see what's possible or not. And a lot of times it fails. Um, fortunately, nobody knows the failures. Everybody just knows the success. But um, there's a lot of stress that goes into it because like you said, we, we, we push the needle on innovation and creativity and that takes risks. And um, um, yeah, one of our best assets are, are our partners for sure. 
I love the fact that you're pushing the limits to failure because you won't know where the limits are otherwise, right? You know, uh, Victor, I'm going to ask you a question that I haven't prepared you for, but uh, but I think it's an important one as well. You also grew up with Denis Flagellet as well. Uh, what did you learn from Denny? What is his vision for watchmaking and how did it affect you? Um, yes, Denny, Denny shared a lot of stuff with me uh, for 30 years now and the most important thing is that uh, his intentions are pure. He wants to do uh, watchmaking and not only watchmaking but uh, uh, the forge aussi. Um, he do the mobilier at home um, and without compromise. He's always he has a vision and he don't change his mind until uh, he reached the goal he wanted. And uh, this perseverance and this. Uh, Force de character is a, uh, c'est un, comment dire, un vrai exemple pour moi. True example. A true example. example. Since, since I have you and I'm asking, and you're talking about Denny, tell me about the watch that's on your wrist. <laughs> this is the um, the the Betune Digital uh, I've made a few years ago. Um, and you you made it. Yes, I made it. Um, when I I start my internship at uh, the Betune. Uh, in 2013, uh, I, uh, we had a deal with Denis previously. Uh, <laughs> that's a funny part of the story. Um, when I was a teenager and he launched the Betune, of course, I was a teenager and I was like, ah, the digital, when I saw this watch, it was love at first sight. And I asked him if he can give one digital to me. And he said, if you want to watch like this, you have to make it by yourself because it's a huge work. So one day, if you take the time to come to the workshop and uh, I will show you and I will teach you how to make a watch. So it happens and it was a, a difficult work as I'm not a watchmaker. Uh, it, it was a big challenge and I success. It's, it's not the, um, uh, the between quality standard, I think. There is a lot of default on it, but it's my watch. And thank you, Denis. That's beautiful. <laughs> ben, I'm expecting you to make an astronomia for yourself. <laughs> Okay, I have a different question for you as well. You know, uh, when I, I follow your Instagram, and I love it, and it's such a family enterprise, right? Your sister is uh, heading up the operation in the United States. I mean, you, you spend all your time with your family. Tell me how this empowers you. It's great. You know, uh, my, my brother, my sister, my father are, are all in the company. Uh, my wife helps on, on Tuesdays when the kids are in school, which is also great. Uh, she's always happy to see me there, I'm sure. <laughs> but we, we, we really have a, a, a great time. I mean, we're... I think it's important to have the family with me on this. It's a huge challenge. So, you know, we give each other energy. My father has been a great role model for all of us. Um, he worked very hard, very, very hard. And uh, he didn't, you know, it, it, he started, Roventa had tough times when he took over and uh, he started as an apprentice in that company and took it to CEO and one of the leading companies for watch production in Switzerland. So we have a great role model to follow. Uh, we will. We all look up to him, and um, with uh, Norcane, what's great is we're doing something that my father never did, right? Because he could never do a brand, because he was in competition with actually his partners that he always, you know, he did everything for his partners. So we're actually now building that dream, and it's great. And I think my father, probably the chairman with the most holidays in the Swiss watch industry at the moment, <laughs> is not always there, but he's always there to guide us. So that's great. That's awesome. He must be very proud of you. Brian, you have great taste in watches. I know this because you have the same taste that I have in watches. And, and I remember many years ago, uh, I, I, I showed up at Basel and I was wearing an old Roger Dubuis Lemania 2310 chronograph in 36 mm. And you're like, I love that watch. Um, tell me what has been the form of your watch education? Like how have you become a true watch nerd? Um, I mean, I think it was a pretty organic. Like I started working in our retail stores at 12 or 13 years old. And so the watch industry has changed so much and I've had such an opportunity to just see the brands change and evolve over time and really figure out what I like, what I didn't like. Um, 
And uh, I would say just being a collector first um, and then selling watches second uh, has really sort of informed me and I'm just constantly learning about the different brands that are out there um, and seeing what's new and interesting. And um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of uh, what laid the foundation for it. And um, I think I always knew that I was gonna do it and I think just uh, getting to work with you know, brands like D. Bethune and whatnot really sort of created the taste that I have today. Okay, now I have a quick follow-up question then. What is the one watch you don't own that you must have one day? Uh, a Patek Philippe 3939. Very nice. Which is a small minute repeater tourbillon. Nice. Pierre Beaver, you know more about vintage watches than almost anyone else I, I know. Tell me about oh, the no, form no. of your oh, education. That, that's not true. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell me about the, the shape of your education. Uh, and then also, let's end also with that same question. What is the one watch that you don't own that you would love to have? Which, which, one, which question do you want? First, start with, the, tell me about your education, okay, the perfect. educational process. So um, obviously at home was the first step of my education process uh, within the watch industry. Um, but where it really kicked off for me was when I, when I joined Philips uh, because I got to see the watch industry through a whole other spectrum, the spectrum of vintage watches, of history, of what was done in the past, uh, how people have done it, and also it opened uh, my eyes to independent watchmaking. And altogether, uh, having to, to work with my colleagues to find the watches, source the watches, uh, look for defaults or um, anything, any special watches, really taught me a lot about um, the mechanics, like real watchmaking. Uh, but also the history, the, the decisions brand have made and how it influenced the watches, the production, uh, the materials that were used. And it really broadened my mind to the history of watchmaking. And that's really where I got, a, I'd say, the most uh, feeling for what the watch industry is. And then for the watch I'd, I really desperately would like to own is, well, obviously my own watch that uh, hopefully uh, we'll see the light of day soon. I should have made a rule that you can't choose your own watch. Okay, okay. for the rest of you guys, you can't choose your own watch. Uh, tell me a little bit about a mentor that you had called James Marks. What did, what did he do for you? So James is somebody very special in my life. He's truly a mentor. Um, he's very close to a brotherly figure as well. Uh, he, he taught me a lot about life in general, not any watches. And I think the biggest lesson he taught me uh, is you know, he, he had a completely different career from the watch industry. And he, had, he did that leap of faith where he just said, look, I'm, I'm very passionate about watches and I want to get into this industry. I think I have enough knowledge. I think I can work my way through the ranks of the watchmaking and particularly the, the vintage watch industry. Um, and he just went for it. And that courage, that, that ability to say, okay, I'm going for it now and we'll figure out a plan later, that's James. And it's a great quality that I try to replicate as often awesome. as I can. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alexander, what has been the shape of your watch education? And what is the one watch you would like to have outside of Richard Mill? Oh. Yeah. I was going to say. Uh, I was say Richard. <laughs> uh, my, my watch education, to be really, again, very honest, uh, very honest, it started when I, the first time I went to the, to the factory. Uh, I was uh, working for a supplier of the brand, uh, doing 3D modeling for, uh, for the brand. And uh, uh, I went to the factory pretty much unannounced and uh, just to see. And uh, again, it's the people there. You know them, uh, the Julien, the, the Salva, uh, uh, Dominique, the whole, uh, the whole family. Uh, just the way everything happened there and the people, their passion, you, you want to know more. You want to know way more than, uh, than, than just the, the visual. And... Uh, um, after that, I, I, start, uh, I started uh, doing the video for the brand, as I said earlier. And uh, doing the video, it was just one man with his camera and going everywhere. In the, in the, they would give me the thing, and I could go everywhere and just uh, make the video for the unannounced watch. And uh, so you just stay there with the watchmaker that, at first, they are pretty shy. But slowly and surely, when they see that you get interested in what, you're, what they are doing and uh, uh, genuinely interested, they start talking to you, and it's just like, creating that uh, uh, brotherhood in the, at the factory, making like uh, having drinks with them and sharing their life. That's how you get yeah, hooked again in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the watchmaking and you want to know every single detail 
of, uh, of, uh, of those watches, how, how they are made. And then you meet the supplier, and then you, it, it's just like, and you meet the client, you see what the client like about those watches. It's all of this meat that you can have in your, in your life that, uh, that uh, make everything uh, uh, improve, and, uh, and then you get even more knowledge and more knowledge, and now being at the board, working on the, on the development of the watches, obviously is the ultimate uh, Dupuyant goal. Now for the watches, I would have say, it's not RM. Uh, I will have to say uh, uh, the very first RM01, the one that uh, my dad was having fun throwing everywhere. This I remember one, that. Yeah, this one I would love to have. And uh, 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 to be honest with you, I, 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 and I'm not saying that because he's here, any MBNF, I would be the happy, happiest man in the world. Really, like any of them, <laughs> I would take it. Fantastic. Great answer, Max. <laughs> Jean, you know, uh, so uh, we had the pleasure of meeting up for a drink um, after you, you, we, we, you, you got my Tag Heuer watch, and, uh, and I was actually honestly intimidated by the level of watch knowledge that you had, so much so that I was like, I hope I, I uh, don't make a fool of myself because this guy knows everything about watches. Um, what has been the form of, watch, of your watch education? Watch education, again, I said uh, earlier that uh, I had a lot of time on my hands at university. Uh, and uh, a lot of times on my own meant a lot of times reading articles, reading blogs, watching anything I could find, uh, and, uh, and really exposing myself to watches like that. Uh, trying to gain more knowledge, uh, and, and without even having an, an end goal in sight, just a pure passion came along, you know, uh, uh, figuring out What's the difference between a, a Rolex with a small underline on it versus one that has not? You know, it's only only produced in this year and that year and then not after that. Understanding the uh, production numbers for this, this and that reference and then figuring out, you know, kind of uh, uh, the history of watchmaking also uh, far before uh, the creation of those big brands like Rolex, Patek Philippe and all, and all these. You know, uh, Higgins before then and, 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 and starting from there. I think it went first from obviously a branding perspective of thinking, oh my God, how come... Uh, uh, all these pieces are sold out everywhere, and, and everybody's just uh, uh, dying over them. And then working my way back slowly and figuring out, okay, at the end of the day, you know, they made this watch in 1901, they made this watch in 1862, and then boom, 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 you go back, and, and all of a sudden you're uh, geeking out about uh, clocks from anti Janvier, you know, and then it's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about watches then, you know? <laughs> and then, uh, the, then it really, really happened like that. Thank you, Sarah. And what is the one watch you would like to own that you don't have? So uh, I had the time to think then, but uh, Patek 2523. Very nice, sir. Benjamin, what is the form of your watch education, sir? So uh, my form was a little bit untraditional because my father doesn't come from a technical watch background. He's more design focused. So uh, as soon as I joined, I was like, wow, I, I have a lot to catch up on. And I come from a marketing background. so. Um, I, I believe in order to sell something, you truly have to know the ins and outs of it. So I remember the first day of my job, I called um, our lead watchmaker and I said, look, I have a lot to catch up on. Uh, we have to treat this basically like a university course. <laughs> uh, please put together uh, you know, an eight hour weekly uh, course breakdown with everything I need to know. And, um, and, and that was my, my, my form of education. Thank you, sir. Victoire, I mean, I kind of imagine that with, uh, you know, Vianney is your father and Denny is your stepfather, your watch education must have been amazing. But tell us a little bit about that. I'm, I'm not sure my watch education is amazing, but um, I think my eyes education is it's more about this. Because uh, they, they taught me and all the craftsmen I've been interact with in my life, they, they all taught me how and where to look at so um, my knowledge are more focused on, on the um, details, <laughs> um, details in watches, but also in other kind of crafts. Thank you very much. And uh, Ben, if I may ask you, what has been the shape of your watch education, sir? A lot about finishing, I think. When, when, I, when I started with Norcan, I realized that for me it was very natural to take a case and see which quality level it was. Uh, same for hands, dials. Those are things we discussed 
at home even, you know, my father would say, oh, look at this, it's really nice, and I was maybe still at school. Um, the main moment was really when I realized that I had a huge passion for it, because I was actually reading, learning about it the same, uh, which I didn't do that much at school, so I could compare the level of passion I had at school and for watches, and I really think, you know, watches is, is just something special. If you, if you come, if it's in your blood, uh, you suddenly feel that you're really interested into things that a lot of people around you don't have. So you're talking and you realize that maybe they're not that interested as you and you say, hey, that's my passion, you know. That's awesome. Okay, this is going to be the last question for me before I turn it over to Eleanor Picciotto, who's going to give you the final, final question. Uh, so um, what has been, Brian, your, your, the, your moment of greatest challenge and what has given you the greatest satisfaction? Um, greatest challenge. Um, I will, I'll start with satisfaction. Um, I think just interacting with our global offices and just seeing how much we've grown in such a short period of time. Um, I remember when we opened our first Hong Kong office and we were just absolutely like amazed, right? Like we were, we were speaking to this team, they were overseas and we just couldn't believe that for the first time we had an office there. And then fast forward, you know, we have offices and teams all over the world and it's just, and everybody's so passionate about what they do and everyone is rowing in the same direction and it's just amazing. Um, putting my retailer hat on, I would say opening up the uh, Patek Philippe Boutique in Miami um, has been like a true privilege and honor, and so that's really special. Um, greatest challenge. Um, I think it sort of is the flip side of the first one, is getting to a point where these teams globally really are all working and rowing in the same direction. Um, my dad has been amazing, and, and Justin as well, um, of setting the vision, and, uh, and I think just, um, you know, getting there and never stopping is uh, really the plan. Thank you, sir. Pierre, what's the biggest challenge you face so far, and what has given you the greatest satisfaction? I think um, they kind of merge into one, um, which, are, which is the fact that I have the privilege to work with my father, to learn from him, um, to be able to have a witness and all this knowledge he has, this experience uh, from so close. I think it's both a satisfaction and kind of an ach achievement because um, to, to be able to learn, to evolve, to grow, to become a better person and just to understand and take all that information is something super, that gives me a lot of satisfaction, but at the same time it's very challenging because sometimes you have to, uh, in, in, your, in French you say, serrer ton point dans la poche, I don't know how, like you have to put your ego aside uh, put your convictions aside, listen, and that can be challenging as well. So I think uh, they kind of merge into the same thing, which is being able to learn, to grow, and to evolve. Thank you, sir. Alex, same question for you, sir. I agree. I, it's definitely a, an ongoing process. It's every day you, my satisfaction is being alive, uh, 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 being very happy every day to work with the, with the teams, to work with all those gen different generations, the, the, from the youngsters to the, to, the <laughs> to the father, let's call them this way, uh, 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 older generation and the all in between generation, making sure that everybody succeed to work together and uh, everybody just follow the same, the same path and uh, is just so happy to be here. And, uh, and you have no idea those amount of, of meeting that we can have with uh, uh, all the people working for the brand in general. And then when you have that moment of realization that what have been made in 20 years and uh, 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 I haven't been through the very tough day, days of, uh, of uh, the tough years of, of the brands, but those people have been through and when they see uh, uh, where is the brand now and uh, you see uh, uh, um, tears in their eyes and uh, the, the happiness of what they, what they succeed to do all together, what we succeed to do all together, that's the biggest satisfaction. Now the, the challenges, it's every day, every day is challenges, but uh, 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 one thing that my dad taught me is that uh, there's no real problem or challenges in life, they're just solution, you need to find the solution. And the fun part of all that is to find the solution, so. That's a great answer. Jean, may I ask you the same question, sir? Funny thing is, the uh, greatest challenge is probably the one I'm in at the moment, and it's a consequence of my greatest achievement. Uh, so, uh, obviously, as I said previously, we, we're investing heavily into uh, high craftsmanship uh, in, in all shapes and forms, uh, and really 
put uh, significant resources to, to putting that forward and, and really trying to, to build that uh, the whole side of the, of the manufacturer. But uh, so the greatest achievement was convincing everybody was a great idea. And the greatest challenge is finding everybody to, to try to then you know, uh, g get everything going and get the ball rolling and making sure that entire side of the, of the strategy actually works out in the end. So it's quite challenging, uh, not, not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but uh, you know, it's also uh, part of preserving that savoir-faire for, for, for future generations. You know? As someone has a little bit of an inkling as to what your future lies, I think you've made exactly the right decision and it'll be very successful for you, sir. Uh, ben, may I ask you the same question, sir? The greatest challenge, I would say, is um, trying, to make, trying to make big changes to an existing organization. Uh, when you start your own business, it's your vision, it's uh, how, you, how, you see think, how, you, how you think things should run. But uh, when you try to make big changes to an organization that's been around for almost four decades, um, it could get stressful. <laughs> um, and the greatest achievement uh, would be helping the family business and the family uh, grow um, sign significantly since I joined the business. Awesome, sir. Victoire? I think making my digital was <laughs> one of the <laughs> biggest challenge. <laughs> it has played with my nerves a lot. <laughs> um, but... Um, but in the end, it, it's worth it. And uh, the greatest satisfaction, I'm, I'm sure, it's that my work is useful to Vianney and the, the whole team at the workshop. Awesome, thank you. Ben, may we round it out with you, sir? 2018, definitely biggest challenge because, but not unexpected, launching a new watch brand. Uh, we knew what we were facing. There were not a lot of people that believed in us back in 2018. Uh, we gave it all we had. So the biggest uh, achievement and the best moment was definitely, you know, the past two years, just seeing the brand grow, uh, opening boutiques in Singapore, Zermatt, and uh, having uh, 160 retailers now around the world that trust us. I think uh, Brian Goffberg was one of the first who got us on board. So that's for us special, and uh, we're really happy about that. Yeah. Awesome, guys. So now I'm going to hand over the microphone to, to Eleanor Picciotto. As the daughter of a legend in the watch industry, I thought the question was better coming from her rather than from me. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, so you all have, to some, to some extent, um, a father with very different personalities. You all went from growing up next to them, to obeying to them, to working to them, and finally you all made a first name to yourself. So my question is, and I'm going to start with you, Brian, what is the most important thing that you've learned from your father? Ooh, there's a lot. Um, there's honestly so much, because I've been working with him for so long. Um, I think one of the things that I've always taken away is his ability to turn a negative situation into a positive one. And that you just need to go into that sort of situation uh, with the outlook that you can make something positive out of it. And I've always tried to do exactly that. Um, I mentioned earlier, just um, no's are free, and a yes can change everything. And I think that for those that know him, um, he's heard a lot of no's, but uh, you know, there's been some good yeses along the way also. So, um, but I think that those two things always resonate with me. Thank you. Pierre, same question to you. Um, I think the thing that I learned from my father that's the most powerful is um, just to be passionate about what you do. Uh, he always told us when we were growing up, myself and my siblings, um, just be passionate, go out there, be curious, find what you like and do what you like, no matter what it is. Um, do it full-heartedly, um, be humble, be respectful, and be a good person and find what moves you in life. Thank you. Super tough question. Uh, I've been thinking about it for five minutes. It's very hard. Um, so much, really so, so much. For f There's so much you can, you, can, you can learn from a dad and especially this guy. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I guess the biggest is, is the, the same. Stay humble. Always stay humble. Remember that uh, uh, always put yourself uh, uh, in the place of the people you're talking to. And uh, uh, al 
always um, remember what people did to you and uh, uh, never be uh, ungrateful. You know, it's just like every day, uh, uh, people asking things to my dad that maybe one day they, they loan him anything. They just, he remember this person and he will do anything. Even if it's to the thousand of uh, what that person did for him, he will do it. He will do it because he can do it today and uh, uh, for him he, he, it's important to do it. So I guess, I guess, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I guess it's the same question. <laughs> it is the same question. Um, Obviously, in life in general, uh, I can't even count. Uh, there's obviously a lot of things that I've learned from my father and, and many things. If I look purely professionally, the one thing that he's adamant about and really taught us, uh, the whole family together, is to really focus on the product. And as long as the product is uh, born out of sure passion, but also a, a real respect for the craftsmanship that the metier has behind it, so watchmaking, watchmaking, leather goods being a whole different business. As long as you put that behind it, uh, uh, your, your success will follow regardless of the time frame. And I think that's one of the main values of LVMH also, generally, is just focusing on making good product uh, and, and not really necessarily looking at the immediate return uh, fr from that. And uh, I, I probably took it too much to the letter, but that's exactly what I'm applying for Louis Vuitton. Uh, and really looking at, at, at long term, saying, okay, I, I want to build product which is uh, uh, at that level, and, and we'll put the resources to it, you know, and, and we'll get there. Thank you. Ben, I guess you're the one who has a double question, because your father is not only your father, but also your best friend. So <laughs> what is the most important thing you've learned from your best friend and then from your father? Um... I would say a concept that he has taught us since we were kids is uh, something called skill stacking. So um, don't try to be the absolute best at just one thing, but be good at many things. So you could be creative, be good with numbers, uh, be a good operator, be a good salesman, be a good marketer. Um, this way you have knowledge in all those areas and you could utilize that for business and daily life. Um, so. That and um, humility was a big part of it. And also, like he said, not taking no for an answer. Um, th that word just doesn't exist. Uh, and he often says, like, the word impossible, if you break it up, it's um, possible. So um, that has been a key, key lesson for me, for sure. Thank you. Victoire? It's difficult to choose one. <laughs> uh, well, Vianna taught me a l and give me a lot of tools and good value for the, the daily life and of course for the work. But uh, if I have to choose one, it's really to be authentic in all the layers of my life. Last question for you. Be humble, that's uh, really like the motto and uh, at home always, uh, he always made sure we kept our feet on the ground. It's really important and work hard and you know, I think last but not least, just to always be passionate about what you do uh, and, and to believe in yourself and uh, you know, if things get back tough, get back up. That's always what he said uh, to us. And I think that's also the spirit that, you know, in the beginning of Norkim was the key because we had a lot of downs, so to get back up every time you get hit on the ground. Thank you very much. And you, your dad. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, well, the ch I guess the chance that I have is that I, I do not work with my father. <laughs> um, I don't think it would be a, an actual possibility. Um, but we will, to some extent, collaborate because uh, I can bring to him a couple of things. But to answer very shortly and honestly, um, it would be one passion. Uh, he's probably one of the most passionate person I've ever met in my life. Combined to honesty, being honest at all times. You, you don't have to please everybody just because you don't have to be liked by everyone. But if you do it with honesty and passion, people can disagree, but they cannot blame you for it. So I guess that would be the two most important things. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions? Hopefully not to me, but to these uh, amazing gentlemen. Uh, there's one. <laughs> Thank you for your testimonies, living testimonies. 
Uh, yes, it's very deep. Uh, myself, I was climbing mountains, even Kilimanjaro. What I was thinking about when I heard you, it was I was reading or hearing this morning about Isaiah 9. Wonderful counselor, Everlin, uh, ever, well, I have to translate it in English because I heard it in everlasting father. For myself, even I have a successful father, I had never a father. So I have no example than my heavenly father. It's only to be honest, and even for you to encourage you, God gave you a good father. It's to be grateful to him, to say to him, thank you, even for all the persons here, to say thank you for your situations, to have a so good father, to have the opportunity to do business, to be everywhere, even for everyone. And for me, I didn't know I would be here. But thank you to Jesus. Goodbye. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you to Jesus as well. Um, is there any, uh, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I have a question for Alexandre and, uh, and Victoire. Uh, I work with your, uh, with your father in the, in the first years of 2000, maybe 2003, and with Vianney in 2001. And at that time, when I was ordering a, an antiqua, for example, Vianney was telling me, maybe uh, you will have to wait three months, which was for me the end of the world. <laughs> and it, I think it was in 2005 or six, I ordered RM12. And I think <laughs> I've been wait I was waiting maybe six months. So, and now you but you get it. I got it. Okay, okay. And I sold it. And you know the situation now. You know the waiting list syndrome. Yes. I want to know what's your point of view with that syndrome, and what can be what can be what can be done to make a final client less less frustrated with that situation. That's a very good question. That's my everyday life question. Um, so there's, there's not much uh, uh, that can be done, to be honest with you, because uh, uh, producing more watches, sadly, with, uh, with, uh, with the watches we are doing, uh, uh, it's getting more and more complicated to produce more watches. And the demand is, uh, is, uh, is here. Uh, uh, the way I see it and the way with my team uh, uh, we are working a lot is to make the wait a little less painful. Meaning that uh, 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 how we communicate with the client during the wait uh, period, but reducing that wait period, sadly from the moment uh, uh, we decided uh, to, to make this watch and this watch is successful, that's something we, ha we have to deal with. What we also did, uh, and I'm going more into uh, uh, the detail. Uh, uh, what we did in terms of production is that uh, we, we, we killed a lot of reference, meaning that when before you had 4,000 pieces, let's say, in production, you could have, uh, I don't even want to know, but uh, I want to say, but like, let's say 350 reference, if it's not more, maybe more, uh, uh, 350 reference. And we dialed it down to 150 reference. That's also a first step because in the 5,000 pieces that you are going to, to produce, there will be more of uh, a, a, a less reference, less reference. So that's it. Uh, apart from that, yes, it's how to make it uh, uh, less painful for the people who wait. But sadly, reduce that waiting, that waiting line would mean that uh, 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 you will have to let people go over other people, and we don't even work in the way that uh, uh, we have first Mr. A, then Mr. B, and then Mr. C. It doesn't work like that. It's it's more way more uh, organ uh, organic process. So so I, I don't have a, there's no perfect uh, answer to to that. I'm sorry, but you have the M12, and uh, I love that watch. I really love that watch. <laughs> That's a great watch. Yeah. One of the best of all time. But for the Antiqua, the problem is solved as uh, Vienna stopped to uh, make it. So, voilà. So to, uh, to be on the side, some, some products help to reduce uh, the waiting time on the other and new product. But uh, 
it's more and more long to have a Vianney Halter. And we have a really true relationship with uh, all our customers and they are not in a hurry and they are, most of them are happy to wait. <laughs> and, um, and also good stuff worth waiting for. Victoria, tell them how many meters of finishing, of, on, of onglage, is in a resonance. Uh, in, the, in the new resonance, three meters, uh, point 70. So there's only on titanium. So, there's, so there's three meters and 70 of onglage on titanium bridges that she has to do. So please have patience. <laughs> it's long that uh, it's worth it. Uh, I hear a lot of clients being more and more upset and I'm quite sad to hear that my industry, they have more and more clients upset and frustrated. It's, it's really sad. And so you're telling me that there's no... I mean, I know it's, it's a, a very bitter, bittersweet situation for us because obviously we cannot complain of the success uh, of the brand today, uh, uh, but yeah, no, I, I understand, and I, I trust me. Every day, I can hear the, the client complain, and I, I totally understand. Uh, but ultimately, it's. I mean, the, 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 the only solution will be to go to uh, I don't know, maybe thirty thousand uh, pieces a year. Nobody wants that. The quality won't be here. We have to make sure we have the guardian of the quality of uh, of, uh, of uh, our watches. So I'm not sure that. Uh, 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 I mean, the solution is either you uh, say no to clients that are waiting for their watches to make other people have their watches, or you produce more watches. And uh, we are making watches more and more complicated. Every new model that we release is more complicated than the previous one, and we kill the previous one. So it just, I under, the, the, I'm, have the feeling that maybe also what w makes the people want our watches it's also what make them wait for those watches because they are difficult to make. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Sorry, I know the question wasn't for me, but uh, I felt I wanted to say something. <laughs> something that uh, is the, uh, the flip side, because we often talk about the wait list on the client side, but if we look back historically, for instance, at the quartz crisis, when that hit, all the suppliers, there was a big loss in Switzerland in terms of job losses, uh, families had to get reintegrated in, in like, find new ways of coping with that. And today we're seeing a huge expansion of the watch industry, but we never, you know, the, on, the, on the client side, we don't always take in consideration the suppliers. And for the suppliers to follow that rise in production, they need to make huge investments, um, hire more people, form more people, and it's a pretty big responsibility for them to do that if it crashes tomorrow. So even on a brand level, some brands would love to double their production. Um, but as Alex said, to keep that, qu that quality, you have to expect from your suppliers so much risk taken, and they're not willing to do that understand understandably, that's how you say it. So I think it's important also to realize that even with the most, uh, even uh, you can try as hard as you can to increase production, in some point in the chain from top to bottom, there's some point where the risk is very high, and that's something that is not enough spoken about but is a real problem today. That's a very good point. I'll add one thing. Um, if you go back prior to, let's call it 2018, um, the industry wasn't this way. Many of the references that are most desirable today that were also being made prior to this point were available and sitting in showcases. So perhaps they weren't recognized then or maybe they're just being recognized now and maybe just more clients are being educated globally. But you can see it in the contrast that these were available, they were available at a discount in the past, and now they're trading at, let's call it, big premiums over the retail price, and demand has not changed, sorry, supply has not changed necessarily to account for this, nor should it, right? If, if Alex is saying that quality would be compromised in order to increase, then they shouldn't necessarily increase quantity just because demand has increased. And, I mean, not to, I'm a little bit biased, but, 
Um, you know, time is a luxury, and if someone doesn't want to wait three, four, five, seven years for a timepiece, the watches are available now, and they are available in the secondary marketplace, and they can go and be purchased at, at today's price. Good answer. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Brian Goldberg, Pierre Beaver, Alexandra Mill, Jean Arnaud, Benjamin Arabov, Victoire Halter, and Benjamin Kufer. Thank you very much. Uh, I am in admiration of all of you. Cheers.